Up next, we have a, a very special guest. Tatum, as I told you, is a seminary student at Duke Divinity School. She'll be preaching with us this morning on the text from John chapter 9. Our Possibilities ministry team has recorded that gospel lesson for you today, so you can hear it told through their lens. So we're going to watch the video of the gospel from John chapter 9, and then Tatum's going to preach the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Enjoy. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Well, uh, who sent this man or his parents? That he was born blind. Jesus answered, Neither this man or his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed into him. We must work the works of God who sent to me. While in this day night is coming, when no one can work, as long as we, as long as I am in the world, I am the lights of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but... It's no one like him. He kept saying, I am he. But they kept asking him. Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. Others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes that he opened. He said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son, who, do you, who you say was not was blind, born blind? How then did he, does he not see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We now know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? Now, how did he open his, your eyes? 
He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciple? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his di disciple. We are, not, we are disciples of Moses. We, we know that God has spoken to Moses, but for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to the ones who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born blind entirely in, in sins. Are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him. And that one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I come into the world for judgment. And so those who do not see may become the ones who may become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now that you say, We see we are, or we see your sin remains. This is the gospel, the good news of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks to be to God. God. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for this scripture that we've just read. Thank you for this long, complicated, kind of confusing story. We thank you for it because we know that you will reveal yourself through it so that we can know you more. I pray that you guide my words and fill this time with a testament to your love alone. Thank you for the ways you love us. In the name of your son, Jesus, who we find with the blind man in our scripture today, amen. Thank you all for inviting me here today. As you've heard, I'm a student at Duke Divinity School and an intern at L'Arche, North Carolina, and a dedicated disability justice activist. My biggest passion, though, is diving into the ways that God reveals God's self to and through the disability community. And there is almost nowhere in scripture where I think that the connection between disability and theology is more interesting than in this passage. This has not always been one of my favorite passages though. In fact, for most of my life, I didn't trust the Jesus that I found here. As you can tell, this is a very long, somewhat confusing passage. And many people in my life did not take the time to work through it well. When I was 16 years old, I'm just starting to understand what my functional blindness meant in my life. I went to a pastor at the church that I grew up in, and I asked the age-old question, why did God do this to me? Why won't God heal me? And my pastor answered with this passage. Only He only used the first two verses. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? My pastor told me that it was luckily not my sin or my parents' sin, but that some bodies just show the results of original sin more, disabled bodies. And thus disability was my cross to bear, the result of sin, the world's sin on my body. Years later at a church in college, a pastor made a similar comment from the pulpit joking about how sin shows up as disability, implying that disability was a result of sin, questioning again who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind, 
and leaving it there. So, while this was a long passage that we heard read this morning, I am very glad that it is long, because that means that it does not leave us there at verse 2. It does not leave us blaming disabled people for sin. It doesn't even leave us linking disability and sin at all. In fact, Jesus shuts those ideas down very quickly. He says neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. Y'all, Jesus told us right here that my pastors were wrong. No one sinned. Disability is not a result of sin. Disability isn't even related to sin at all. Disability is so that the work of God might be revealed. And y'all, it took 41 verses to explain all the ways that God worked through this one blind man, this one disabled person. I want you to notice too that Jesus didn't say, this man will be healed so that the work of God might be revealed in him. No, Jesus said that this man was born blind so that the work of God might be revealed in him. Often healing is assumed to be the way that God's work is revealed. But if that were the case, our scripture reading would end at verse seven. Jesus would put the mud on his eyes, he would wash it off, and he would be healed. But the passage didn't stop there. And God's work didn't stop there either. There are so many ways that God's work was revealed in this man who was born blind. Healing is one of those ways that God worked. But even that work of healing isn't as simple as people make it out to be. When we read this passage, it's easy to think that God has healed once, and so that means that God must want healing, as in a cure, for everyone. But we know that cure doesn't come for everyone, and so we must be missing something. Theologian Karl Barth was once asked by another theologian, won't God heal my daughter who is in a wheelchair? And Karl Barth said no. A bit jarring of a response if you ask me. But he followed it up by saying, that makes it sound as if God has made a mistake in your daughter's case. Is it not a much more beautiful and powerful hope that this life was not futile? Because it was not in vain that God has said to it, I have loved you. For some, God's work of love, God's I have loved you, means that they are healed. And for others, God's work of love is revealed through God's creation of disabled people, disabled lives, and disabled culture. Our lives are not in vain. They are not in sin. They are rooted in God's particular love for our particular experiences. For the blind man in our scripture, healing is that work of God's love for his particular life. But healing is not the only way that God's work is revealed in him. Through the rest of the story, he had the opportunity to share God's gifts of prophetic teaching, courage, witness, preaching, faith, and much more. Right after the man was healed, not even a sentence goes by in the story before the man's neighbors start questioning him. They deny his attempts to explain himself, and eventually they bring in the Pharisees and religious leaders, who question him even more intensely. Again, they bring up the idea that sin was the cause of his blindness, and even that a sinner was the cause for the healing. But the blind man remains strong, claiming his identity by saying, I am the man, and continuing to explain the miraculous works that Jesus did. This truth-telling about his own identity and about the work of God in the world is nothing short of a prophetic teaching. Throughout history, disabled people have revealed the work of God in similar ways. There are many stories in our history, collectively and individually, that name the work of God similarly to the narrative of this blind man. The one that I want to focus on today 
is the work of disabled activists at the 504 sit-ins in 1977. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act was the first law that was ever written guaranteeing that disabled people would not be discriminated against. But lawmakers would not sign it. So disabled leaders and activists, including Judy Human, Ed Roberts, Kitty Cohn, and Holland DeLille, protested until their rights were secured by law. They organized a sit-in the longest sit-in in a government building in U.S. history. And for 28 days, over 100 disabled people lived in that building and fought for their rights. For our rights today. They were also doing the prophetic work of truth-telling. They were teaching out of their own lived experience as disabled people about the justice that this community needed. Back in our scripture passage, the blind man takes things even further than just truth-telling and prophecy. After he repeatedly tells the neighbors and the Pharisees his story, they turn to his parents, whose scripture tells us would not give a clear answer because they were afraid of the Pharisees. But the blind man was not. He was full of the courage that God gave him. He was full of the courage of disabled people who continually have to fight just to be believed. The 504 sit-ins were also an incredible story of the courage that God gave disabled people. At this point in our scripture, the blind man says to the Pharisees, I have told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? This line reminds me of the iconic line from Judy Human, the mother of the disability rights movement in the middle of the 504 sit-ins. When she is talking to lawmakers and says with tears in her eyes, I would appreciate it if you would stop shaking your head in agreement when I do not think that you understand what we are talking about. Her courage and the courage of disabled people today to continue to assert ourselves and tell our stories despite the ableism and discrimination that we face is a true work of God in the world. The courage that it takes for us to ask for accommodations, for us to do things differently, to stim, to be our true selves in public, and for us to fight for our rights to inclusion in education the workplace, in churches, and in the community, all show how God is working in and through us in the world today. The blind man then goes on in the next sentence to ask the Pharisees, do you also want to become his disciples? Displaying the clear gift of witness. His witness calls the Pharisees into relationship with Jesus and asks them to open their lives to something new, something better than before. The 504 sit-ins did just that. For the 28 days that disabled people were living in the federal building, they were allowing everyone the chance to communicate and have input, even when it took longer and different modes of communication. They were taking care of each other, making sure everyone had the medications they needed, feeding, clothing, and changing each other, and cheering each other on as they fought. They also had wheelchair races down the hallways. They used sign language to secretly communicate with those outside. They sang civil rights protest songs and they played games. They were living out the justice and anti-discrimination practices that they were hoping for in the world. They were living in the already and not yet of the hope that they had for this law. They were witnessing to the world what they wanted by living it as they fought for it. Finally, the blind man reconnects with Jesus at the end of our story. Jesus is there for him, even though he has been outcast from the rest of society. Jesus tells the blind man who he is, and the blind man quickly replies, Lord, I believe. Yet another work of God that is being revealed in and through this man is that of radical faith. Prophecy, teaching, preaching, and witness, among the other gifts that the blind man displays, 
could not be present without his radical faith. Disabled people had faith in the 504 sit-ins that finally justice would overcome. That finally they would receive their rights. They also had faith in God and they celebrated both Passover and Easter in the building as they fought for this new life that they wanted, free of discrimination. For some of the people there, this time of advocacy was marked distinctively by their communal worship on these holidays and their connection with both the Jewish and Christian faith, which carried them forward. Disabled people today continue to reveal radical faith in God every time they enter a church and trust that they would be welcome there. We reveal radical faith in God when we fight for love and justice. We reveal radical faith in God when we lean into who God created us to be and who God says, I have loved you too. The blind man in this passage and disabled people throughout history reveal the work of God in countless ways. We are missing out in knowing more about God when we exclude disabled people, whether that is done intentionally or unintentionally. When we include disabled people in our congregations, our theology, our leadership, God's work is revealed in ways that we never could have expected. Thank you for journeying with me today, thinking through how God's work is revealed in and through disabled people. I hope that this service allows you to find God's work in the disabled community for the rest of your lives. Because as our scripture attests to, the work of God is revealed through disabled people. And we surely don't want to miss that in scripture or today. Thank you.